It's hard to believe Yu-Gi-Oh! has been around for over 25 years now. While more things change in the game, however, the more things stay the same. So I thought it would be fun to talk about a monster type that has been around, believe it or not, since the game's inception and becoming an actual threat in 2003 with the release of Legacy of Darkness. I introduce to you the fan-favorite warrior monster type. And today we're going to talk about the first ever competitive warrior deck in its history, starting with its rise to prominence and quiet decline, but yet never truly dying, because spoiler alert, warrior decks have still been amazing decks to this day. I'm looking at you heroes and Goki in the past with Rongo Bongo and every Noble Knight deck ever. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Avery and this is a Warrior Toolbox Format Retrospective. Yugi and his friends are playing the hottest new game, Duel Monsters, and getting in over their heads. What? Monsters? Real monsters? Join us for a special presentation of Yu-Gi-Oh! Friday night at 7.30 on Cartoon Network. Warriors have existed since the game's inception, but they didn't get powerful support until 2003 with the Legacy of Darkness booster set. This set introduced two cards that would go on to form the core of warrior decks for years to come, Exiled Force and Reinforcement of the Army. These core cards work to complement the already wide selection of different and diverse warrior type monsters that were available at the time. This caused the warrior deck to gain significant traction at the local level. However, because of the overwhelming power of decks at the time like Hand Control and Chaos Control, Warriors were never able to make a significant foothold in the higher levels of the competitive meta. Warrior decks wouldn't truly take off until the meta had flattened more by the time of GOAT format and later. This is largely due to the elimination of the most overwhelming powerful cards from the competitive game in combination with the release of further warrior support. Although not all the early warrior cards saw competitive use, they're important to go over regardless. The most important warriors were all released in Legacy of Darkness, that being Marauding Captain, Exile Force, and Reinforcement of the Army, aka Rhoda. Exile Force was definitely the most used out of these three, seeing play as a staple monster in almost all decks for years to come. The card's strength came from its targeted destruction at the cost of only one card. The only other truly comparable card at the time was Tribute to the Doom, which required its user to discard a card, meaning that the user ended up with a net minus one in card advantage. It was also good, because back in the day, you had the ruling known as priority. So you could summon out your exile force, and before the opponent could use trap pole or torrential tribute, you could call priority to tribute the exile force and still destroy the opponent's monster. Marauding Captain was also an extremely vital card to the early warrior deck strategy. By allowing a special summon, it gave a distinct advantage in field presence that other cards at the time could not properly match. Furthermore, Marauding Captain's effect could be used to summon any other monster, giving it synergy with the various different staple monsters that saw play at the time, such as Gemini Elf, Tribe infecting virus and sangin he also gave essential protection from battle if used with other warrior monsters cementing his spot as the central piece in dedicated warrior decks Although he would fall off in usage in later iterations of the deck, Marauding Captain's ability to special summon a monster at a time when special summoning was uncommon landed it at semi-limited in an early forbidden and limited list. Finally, there was Rhoda. While it didn't see massive usage at the time of its release, it was a truly revolutionary card. By providing search power in the form of a spell, it gave utility that nothing else at the time did. Instant access to key combo pieces and important cards. At this point, the only other major searchers were monsters such as Sangin and Mystic Tomato, which are most often activated by being destroyed by battle. This, combined with the wide variety of different effects that even early warrior monsters offered, made this a great card that could be integrated into any deck that wanted to run a warrior engine. Beyond these three essential cards, there were a variety of different warrior monsters that served as the quote-unquote tools of the deck. These included Sasuke Samurai, Hayabusa Knight, Goblin Attack Force, Zoma of the Dark, and Don Zalug. All these monsters served different purposes and could be searched easily with Rhoda. Sasuke Samurai had the ability to destroy face-down defense position monsters without flipping them or performing damage calculation. The popularity of Magician of Faith and Mystic Tomato at the time made this particularly useful. Hayabusa Knight was largely useful for putting out damage through its multiple attacks, and was often combined with a powerful equip spell such as United We Stand or Mage Power. Goblin Attack Force and Zone of the Dark served largely the same purpose, which was to establish a high attack threat on the board, protecting a player from being able to be overcome by standard 1900 attack monsters or weaker tribute monsters such as Air Knight, Power Shaft, and Vampire Lord. Blade Knight was also an especially popular warrior across most decks after its release due to its combination of potentially high attack and the ability to prevent flip effects, giving it a similar usefulness to Mystic Swordsman Level 2. Finally, there was Don Zalu, which allowed for the control of an opponent's resources by discarding cards from their hand. However, with these monsters offered great utility, they didn't really counter the dominant hand control and chaos strategies that kept warriors out of the meta before 2005. The set of monsters that really brought warriors into the spotlight were two monsters with similar effects, the DD Monsters. 
In late 2003, the Dark Crisis booster set was released, and along with it came DD Warrior Lady, DD meaning different dimension. She immediately became a staple in almost every deck, largely due to her banish based removal effect and her light attribute coming together to make a potent force for the upcoming Chaos meta of 2004. While DD Warrior Lady was definitely a staple, she was largely used in more dedicated Chaos decks and not paired with any other warrior support. This would start to change by the end of 04 with the release of two new cards DD Assailant and Blade Knight. Assailant was released as a video game promo card in late 2004, although it didn't immediately catch on in the meta. This would start to change as the post Forbidden List meta solidified more by early 2005. The first major event of 05, Shonen Jump Championship Las Vegas, would see the debut of a variant of the still popular Chaos deck that focused on the two new DD Warrior monsters, often alongside Blade Knight or Dunn's Luke. The popularity of this was largely pioneered by Wilson Luke, who was the winner of the event. He ran multiple copies of both DD Warrior Lady and DD Assailant alongside a Blade Knight and a Don Zalug. Most importantly, he complemented these warriors with two copies of Rhoda. This inclusion of Rhoda started a trend amongst Chaos decks in this format to utilize a small warrior engine largely focused around getting the DD monsters out as quickly as possible. It was also the first real instance at a high level event of a deck with a more dedicated warrior engine winning. After the April 2005 Forbidden List limited DD Warrior Lady, the Warrior Engine had to adjust. Instead of focusing its efforts entirely on searching out DD Warrior Lady as quickly as possible, a copy of DD Survivor was often added in. Survivor served as a counterplay to DD Assailant and Warrior Lady as it would return to the field after being banished, making it safe to use against an opponent's DD monsters. As the post Forbidden Limited List format started to transition to the classic GOAT format that we know of today, the Warrior deck definitely became less popular. It didn't fall out of the meta, however, due to Rhoda's ability to search such a large card pool at a time when searching was a relatively rare effect, the deck was able to maintain relevance. To replace the two copies of DD Warrior Lady that Warriors lost with the April 2005 Forbidden List, Don's Lug and Exiled Force started to see a resurgence in play. Goat format also saw the rise in the Warrior Engine as a side deck choice in several top deck lists. The advantage of this was the versatility that many monsters in the Warrior toolbox that they provided, while simultaneously increasing the chances of seeing DD Warrior Lady and Blade Knight, cards that most chaos-oriented decks of the format already ran. Of particular note, for the Warrior Toolbox side deck was the use of Mystic Swordsman Level 2, a slightly stronger version of the older Sasuke Samurai. While flip effect monsters had largely fallen out of favor during the higher powered Chaos formats, they saw a resurgence in the slower GOAT format. Magician of Faith started to be run at higher quantities in many decks and was often used alongside other monsters that Mystic Swordsman could bypass such as Apprentice Magician, Knight Assailant, and DD Assailant. As GOAT format wound down in the fall of 2005 with the October 2005 Forbidden List, the new format seemed relatively wide open. In the power vacuum left by GOAT Control, Warrior Toolbox rose to the occasion. The consistency that the deck was able to offer, combined with its ease of access to DD Assailant, a card that was rapidly becoming a staple in all decks, allowed Warrior Toolbox to rise to the top. The standard set of Warrior Monsters stayed roughly the same as it had been during GOAT format. The main advantage that the deck had over other competitive decks at the time, such as Monarchs, was its versatility. Before the prevalence of Warrior Toolbox, the dominant deck building strategy in the TCG had been to fill the deck with as many generic and powerful cards as possible. This strategy had proven to be very efficient before the first Forbidden List due to the sheer volume of extremely powerful generic cards available in the card pool. But by the fall of 05, most of those cards had been either limited or banned. The Warrior Toolbox, however, still offered a similar type of utility that many of those limited and forbidden cards had. It was because of this combination of factors that the Warrior Toolbox engine rose to prominence as the best deck of the October 2005 ban list. The main shift from how the deck was played in GOAT format was the increased frequency of three copies of DD Assailant, as well as the main deck usage of a larger set of Warriors. While before, usually only two non-DD Warriors were run in the main deck, once Warrior Toolbox entered the higher level meta, it was common to see players running a copy of Don's Alug, Exile Force, and Mr. Swordsman level 2 in the main deck, in addition to Blade Knight or a larger DD engine in some cases. The first major win for a more dedicated Warrior Toolbox deck was Philly Luna's first place deck list at Shonen Jump San Francisco in December 2005. Yes, that is Karibo that you see in the side deck. At its core, the deck was still filled with many staples of the format, such as Cyber Dragon, Spirit Reaper, Sakuratsu Armor, and Smashing Ground. But what makes Luna's deck special was its shirking of chaos. Most meta decks at the time were focused on Chaos Sorcerer, with some DD monsters in a small warrior toolbox usually run with only zero or one copy of Rhoda. Luna's deck, however, was a much more dedicated warrior deck, running a four-card DD engine, two copies of Donza Luke, and Exiled Force. 
This coupled with his two copies of Rota, the maximum lethal amount allowed at the time, which made the deck much more consistent and able to outpace the opponent in terms of resources. Although Luna's side deck was largely devoid of warriors, it did include a single copy of Mystic Swords in level 2 to counter decks that focused more on flip effect monsters. While Warrior Toolbox had dominated the late 2005 metagame, the beginning of 2006 saw the meta start to shift in a different direction. The shift was more towards summing out powerful monsters such as Chaos Sorcerer and the Monarch monsters. While these cards had been played previously, strategies were now starting to converge around them. Most of this, the more utilitarian nature of Warrior Toolbox, started to lose out. There were a few main decks that started to supplement Warriors, however. Chaos, Tomato Control, and Monarchs. Chaos had already been present in the previous format, but was often just a standard beatdown style deck that ran a single copy of Chaos Sorcerer for much the same reason that BLS had been run during the GOAT format. The newer iteration of the deck started to run multiple copies of Chaos Sorcerer and viewed summoning it as one of the main goals of the deck. This naturally didn't mesh well with the Warrior Toolbox, as many of its members were Earth, giving them no synergy with Chaos Sorcerer. Tomato Control also proved to be a powerful contender in the meta, as the deck had a similar consistency to Warriors. Tomato Control's main advantage over Warriors was the deck's access to a more powerful pool of dark monsters such as Apprentice Magician, Sangin, and Spirit Reaper. Finally, Monarch started to see increasingly more play starting in 2006. While Monarchs had been out since 2004, the deck had only seen minor competitive play as a dedicated strategy before 06. This would change mainly with the introduction of Treeborn Frog in early 2006. And if you're getting vibes from our Monarch format retrospective, you should be because it was around in 2006 and we made a video on it, shameless plug. This card made it much easier to maintain the consistent tribute fodder that the deck needed to keep summoning Monarchs. The rise of these more dedicated Monarch decks helped to push out Warriors more than Chaos and Tomato Control due to their focus on tribute summoning, not synergizing with warriors, meaning that monarch decks often opted to not even use the smaller warrior engines that other decks did. This did not, however, completely push Warrior Toolbox out of the meta. Several decks in the top 8 at SJC Orlando in March of 2006 ran a Warrior Toolbox engine, but even these decks had already started to move Warriors over to being a tech engine again instead of the main driving force behind the deck, opting to focus on Tomato Control or Chaos instead. One such example of a deck with a Warrior engine that also ran other primary strategies was Jerry Wang's top 4 list from SJC Durham in February of 2006. The deck ran only a small warrior engine, with no DD Assailant being present, as the deck focused largely on dark monsters to help synergize with both Mystic Tomato and Strike Ninja. He did sign more Mystic Swords in level 2s in the second copy of Rota, but this can largely be attributed to how popular of a side deck choice Mystic Swords in level 2 was at the time to counter the large number of floater monsters that were present in the meta. The reign of dedicated Warrior Toolbox decks would be put to rest for good with the April 2006 Forbidden Limited list, which saw DD Assailant Limited. This eliminated the main focus of more dedicated Warrior engines. While various Warrior monsters would see play in the upcoming format, Rhoda rarely accompanied them, and they were mostly techs in the Chaos Return and Monarch decks that had come to dominate the format. By the time that the April 2006 format fully took shape, the Warrior Toolbox had largely been relegated to an even lesser status than it had held during GOAT format the previous year. Warriors would make a small resurgence after the October 2006 ban list went into effect and banned Chaos Sorcerer, but the impact was small. The closest that the deck got to a last raw was Chris Leonhardt's DD deck in late 2006, but this deck was more of a precursor to the more dedicated DD decks that would appear later, focused less on Warriors and more on the banishing mechanic. As the game started to move forward, it was rapidly becoming too fast for older playstyles such as Warrior Toolbox to stay competitive. The deck that embodied this the most was Airblade Turbo, which is also on the channel, another shameless plug. <laughs> Upon its release, the sheer consistency and power of cards such as Elemental Hero, Stratos, Destiny Hero, Diamond Dude, and Disc Commander made the older Utility Warrior cards obsolete. This new Destiny Hero engine would completely supplant the Warrior Toolbox as the Warrior engine of choice, and while certain members of the Toolbox would continue to pop up as tech choices throughout the rest of the era, they would never again sit as the dominant deck. Stratos would tie this engine together and due to its much more potent searching capabilities, relegated Rhoda to being a searcher more for Stratos than anything else. The final nail in the coffin of Warrior Toolbox as even a casual deck would arrive in the March 2009 ban list, with Rota finally being limited. Although it was limited due to other more powerful Warrior engines at the time, the limiting of the core Warrior Searcher made sure that any future attempt to bring the deck back would be for naught. At its core, Warrior Toolbox started out as a casual deck and transformed into one of the very first competitive engines in the history of the game. While other engines would leave a more profound impact on the game's history, Warriors came from a time where decks didn't have a united central theme. The Warrior Toolbox engine would kick off the trend of more cohesive and synergistic decks. Due to the prevalence of archetypes in the game today, it's unlikely the Warrior Toolbox will ever come back as either a dedicated deck or as an engine. 
All in all, the Warrior Toolbox deck helped to shape the modern game of Yu-Gi-Oh that we see it today. And while it didn't last in the meta for very long, its impact can still be seen in the game today, 25 years later. I hope you guys enjoyed that video. If you did, a like and subscribe to the channel would be very much appreciated. Uh, I vaguely remember Warrior Toolbox. I didn't start playing competitively until 2008. But it's amazing to see that even to this day, Warriors are still played to some degree, whether it's Heroes or Infer Noble Knights, whatever the case may be. I hope that you enjoyed this story, and I will see you in the next video.